Here we are on Friday night, and it's time to talk about textual criticism. When we say textual criticism, we don't mean criticizing the Bible. We're talking about critiquing or examining the Scripture. Now, there's a big uh, turmoil in the world today about what is the correct Bible. Well, and then when you, when you run across a lot of these people, they'll be arguing for one whether it's James White or whether it's, uh, oh, it's a predestination book. What am I doing with that down here? Uh, and there's Kevin James. He goes into uh, text. And then here's Kurt Aland and Barbara Aland. They wrote one of the uh, parsing guides. But it comes from, their, their, they tout the Westcott and Hort text. I don't believe in the Westcott and Hort. And here's one by Richard Elliott Friedman, who wrote the Bible. Here's four reasons for defending the King James Bible, and this is by D.A. Waite. Now, he'll say some good things, but I'm not going to defend the King James, because the King James Bible is not the inspired Word of God, and that makes people mad, doesn't it? I use the King James Bible because the text that the King James Bible comes from is the inspired Word of God, and that is the Greek text. We've only had the English language around about a thousand years. If the King James Bible, which was translated in 1611, is the inspired Word of God, what was the inspired Word of God in 1610? Huh? And what was the inspired Word of God in 500 A.D.? Well, here it is right here. This is the inspired Word of God. This is called the interlinear Bible or the Textus Receptus. Here is the inspired Word of God. Uh, to, lo, well, I can't read it upside down. I thought I was going to. To, Loipana loi Delphoi. There's the inspired Word of God. To, Loipana Delphoi, Mu, Karete in Kurio. That's the inspired word of God. It's Greek. There was no English language 2,000 years ago. Now, you've got many Greek texts. You've got, they, they had so many for so long. They had, they started naming the text by the alphabet. They'd call it Codex A. That's the word Codex. Codex means manuscript. Manuscript. And manuscript means a copy. It doesn't mean it's the original. Now, a copy of what? Well, a copy of what they call the autograph, and the autograph was the original writing. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, the original letter written to 1 Corinthians was called the autograph. Now, where do these copies come from, and where's the big argument about whether we should use an NIV or an RSV or an, or an NASB or, or an American Standard or, or a King James? Well, let me go into this one more time. Let me write this down so we can see it. And how do you prove what is the correct text? Now, I'm very perturbed at most of the so-called scholarly religious world because most of the uh, world have accepted what is called the Westcott, Westcott and Hort. These were two, quote, biblical scholars that lived in the 1800s. Now, Mr. Hort, will somebody go turn that thing off? If you flip that button all the way over to the side, it won't, it won't ring. Uh, Mr. Hort more or less recruited Mr. Westcott, who started off somewhat innocent. Mr. Hort, at 23 years old, 23 years old, he called the Textus Receptus, Textus Receptus, which is the text. Are you, are you, I'm, when I get too close to a board, I can't spell. R-E-C-E-P-T-U-S. R-E-C-E-P-T-U-S. That's a Latin word that means the received text. The reason it was called the received text is because for 1,600 years, that was received by the majority of the world. 
and it and it's very closely aligned with what's called the majority text majority text now this back in the old ancient world it was called a Byzantine text Byzantine because it came out of the Byzantine Empire or it came out of Constantinople or what we call Turkey up here and this is where this is where the Textus Receptus evolved from and we know of course we know originally of course where, what's in Turkey we say Turkey well you've got the church at Ephesus you got the church of Colossia the church of Troas you have Galatia, which is right about where that yellow spot is there. And when Paul went on his first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, he went to this state of Galatia. He went to Antioch. He was thrown out of Antioch by the, by the rabbis of the synagogue about 75 miles away. He went over to Iconium the following Sabbath, preached there. These same guys stayed so angry because he had drawn such a big crowd he outdrew them. They went over and had him thrown out and stirred the people up and had him thrown out of Iconium. And he went down to a pagan city, Lystra. These same guys for, three, for two weeks came down there, stirred these guys up and had him thrown out of Lystra. And then, he, then they stoned him and left him for dead outside of Lystra. And then he went on down to Derby. And then after he uh, finished this, he went back to Lystra, back to Iconium, back to... Antioch. So whenever you're studying the book of Galatians, don't you think you need to find out in the book of Acts who he's talking to and why he's talking to? He's talking to the people on his first missionary journey where he went here into Galatia. So when you're going to study the book of Galatians, you've got to study the 13th and the 14th chapters of Acts because there goes my books. Because there goes my books. All right, now, let me put this back together. And I'll be back up. Y'all don't worry about this, and I won't. All right, now, I got books coming out of my ears. Now, we're talking about the proper text. Westcott and Hort, Mr. Hort, at 23 years old, he coined a phrase, and he said that the Textus Receptus was a vile text. And he spent his entire lifetime trying to prove that. He, he just simply wanted a doctrine all of his own, and so what he did, he recruited Mr. Westcott, and what they did, they came together, and for his entire lifetime, he came up and he was trying to prove that the Texas Receptus was the incorrect text, and they had dug up two texts. They had dug up the, they dug up the Codex Aleph, Aleph, and of course we know that the Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and the Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and they came up with the text called the Baeth, B-E-Y-T-H, the Baeth, and that's the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and they called them Codex, or they called them Manuscript A and Manuscript B. Well, where did they get this from? They got it out of what was called the Vaticanus, Vaticanus, and the Alexandrian text. The Alexandrian text, Alexandrian text, Alexandria is in Egypt. There was a cathedral, a Roman Catholic cathedral called St. Catherine's Cathedral. They found Codex Baeth. In, in St. Catherine's Roman Catholic Cathedral, and they found the Vaticanus uh, in the Vatican. Now, you would think that the Roman Catholic Bible would come out of this text, wouldn't you? But it didn't. The Roman Catholic Bible comes from the Textus Receptus. It even comes from the correct text. You can pick up the Roman Catholic Bible, and you can get the truth from it. Now, you say, what is it about the Roman Catholic Bible that's not right? Well, for one thing, they took the pseudepigrapha. Pseudo means false. Graph means writing in the, in the Greek. Or graphe, G-R-A-P-H-E. You remember over there, you remember over there in, in uh, Jude 4 that there are men before of old ordained to this condemnation and that word ordained is the word prographo, prographo, 
That word pro means before written down. They were they're predestined or preordained, not predestined, but preordained for this condemnation. They were vessels of wrath. That word graphe, we say graph. We say, oh, here's a graph, and, and, uh, but they call that a writing. And I'm going to chart this graph here. Well, we get our word graph from the word graphe, which means it's the Greek word for writing. Now, I don't know why I said that. I've got too many things to say, I guess. The Roman Catholic Bible. Okay, the Roman Catholic Bible, yeah. The Roman Catholic Bible, thank you for reminding me. The Roman Catholic Bible has the pseudepigrapha, pseudo false writings. They're not false writings. It's actually the Apocrypha uh, between the Testaments or what's called the Maccabees. There is nothing wrong with studying the Maccabees. The Maccabees was, it was a time period. Let me, let me just give this up here. You've got at the end of the book of Malachi, you've got a time period, a time period between the Testaments, between the Testaments, between the Testaments, and that's a time period of 350 to close to 400 years, and that's a time period during the, what they call the Hasmonean, H-A-S-M-O-N-E-A-N, Hasmonean Dynasty. What that was, was Judas Maccabeus, around 166 B.C., Judas, Judas Maccabeus, Judas Maccabeus was, he was a Jew in around 166 B.C. when Daniel had prophesied over in Daniel 11, when he prophesied the desolation of abomination and over in Daniel 9, 27, there was an Old Testament picture of the man of sin that will that that at the end of time would rise up there's an old testament picture and that picture is is Antiochus Epiphanius Antiochus A N T I O C H U S Antiochus E P I P H A N I U S you can see where those words those names come from if you've been here at Grace and Truth Antioch when, whatever, Antiochus, when he took over the Seleucian Empire, let me just go ahead and say this. When General, gosh, I can't go anywhere without wandering off. Uh, when Alexander the Great died in the 4th century B.C., four of his generals took over his world ruling system. The Seleucian kings were right above Israel in Syria. That's where Antiochus was. The Ptolemies were down here. Ptolemy was one of his generals. And Lysacomus, he was another. He took over up here. And then or Cassander took over up here in uh, upper Mesopotamia. And then S Sac uh, Cassander took over here in... Lysacomus took over in Greece. Cassander took over here. But what we're zeroing in on is... is uh, I got off on this with the Roman Catholic Bible. But I'll go ahead and say it so you'll understand. It's okay to study the Maccabees. Rome was the ruling system when, when Antiochus comes up. And whenever he is the king, the Seleucian king, you'll notice you've got an Antioch here and an Antioch over here in Galatia named after him, Antiochus. When he goes down to attack Egypt, Rome tells him to back off. And he goes back, hating the Jews, goes into Jerusalem in the temple and desecrates the temple and raises up an asteroid or a tree goddess in the temple and offers a pig on the altar. And that happens during the Maccabean era. That happens during the Hasmonean dynasty, during the time period that we call between the Testaments. And it was two years later that, that uh, Judas Maccabeus, they called him the hammer because he was such a great warrior and he... And he performed guerrilla warfare trying to drive out Antiochus. What, what the between the Testaments is, it's not, let me say this real clear. Between the Testaments is not inspired word of God. But it can be used as a commentary as to history and what was going on. So I'm not going to kick at the Roman Catholics for embracing the Maccabees. But I'm going to kick at them for, for including it into the 
canon of Scripture. It doesn't belong there. If you want to read the Maccabees, you can go to a bookstore, Christian bookstore, and you can order uh, the Maccabees, and it'll be about Judas Maccabeus, and now he throws out what's so amazing. During that time period, he throws out the, on December the 25th, that was the day that Antiochus Epiphanes raised up the tree goddess in the temple. That was the birthday of Hercules, or or Adonis, or, or Mithras, their fire god. He raised up, when he attacked Israel, he raised that goddess, that god up in the temple, desecrated the temple in, uh, on December the 25th. And two years later, Judas Maccabeus threw it out of the temple on December the 25th. And they rededicated the temple, and that's called the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Lights, or Hanukkah. So Hanukkah has nothing to do with Christ's mass. It's throwing the fire worship out of the temple, and then here we are. We embrace the Christ mass or the fire worship of the ancient world, and then we get together with the Jews and say, you got Hanukkah and we got Christmas, and they're totally opposite. But that all happened during the Maccabean era. Now you can go get the Maccabees, and, and it's good to read. It's just, as much, it's just as much commentary as some of my commentaries are. But you can't take it as the inspired word of God. When you get into the lost, the pseudepigrapha, which is false writings, it doesn't mean the writings are false. It means they were written by somebody. You have the book of Enoch, the book of Judith. Judith was supposed to be the woman that, that Jeremiah was forbidden to marry because he was going to declare judgment on Israel. Well, whether she was or whether she wasn't, I don't know. You can go into these books and you can find some truths. But the point is, Roman Catholicism got their Bible from the Textus Receptus, not from the Vaticanus or the Alexandrian text. What is all of this about? Well, the King James Bible comes out of the Textus Receptus. King James is not the inspired Word of God. The Textus Receptus is. You can't properly translate Greek into English. I always keep this, this definite article, the. Here's the word the in the scriptures. This is, you can take this out of a Greek book. I took it out and enlarged it. This is the word T-H-E, the definite article, the. There's 24 ways to spell it. How are you going to translate that into English? You're not going to translate that into English. That's, we go, that's why we go back if it's, Nominative case, genitive case, dative case, accusative case. You say, I don't know what accusative case is. Sure you do. It's a direct object. You know what nominative case is? It's the subject of the sentence. Genitive case is the indirect object. So wherever you've got a, you've got, you've got the masculine, feminine, neuter gender in the singular, masculine, feminine, neuter gender in the plural, and you've got the different cases in the plural and the singular, so you've got 24 ways to spell T-H-E. How are you going to translate that in English? Well, you got that with every word. Y'all can have a copy of this. Anybody that don't have it, we'll make you a copy before you leave. And uh, so, and I've said it before. You can take every word of Scripture. You can take every word, and you've got anywhere from 16 to 27 ways to spell all of the different Greek words. That's because the Greek language had all these shades and nuances to it. We don't have that in the English language. We're just a bunch of crude barbarians. I've said it before. If someone back in the first century could step forward and see us and listen to us and all of a sudden understand our language, they'd probably be scared out of their, out of their lives thinking we're going to bring a club out in a minute and knock them in the head because we're that crude. We have a very crude language that expresses nothing. Now, we're talking about what's the idea? Why am I explaining this? Well, because, because King James comes from the Textus Receptus of the Received Text. Up until the end of the 1800s, this was the popular text of the Bible. Since 1881, when Westcott and Hort dug up the Aleph and the Baeth, are the Vaticanus and the Alexandrian texts. Since they did that, this has become the popular text of the world. Out of this text comes the NIV, the American Standard, the Revised Standard Version, 
the NASB, the NEB, the New English Bible, all of these and more. Well, what's the difference in the text? If you're in a church and your preacher's got a Westcott and Hort or an NIV, if he has an NIV and he's reading along and you're saying, wait a minute, he skipped a verse here. That's because his comes from a different text than yours. They've got words inverted, uh, changed over, verses left out. Why? That's the question, why? For one reason. And it just boggles my mind why men like A.T. Robertson, as brilliant a uh, Greek theologian as he was, and men like J. Gresham Machen, and Mr. Machen wrote a book in the first part of the 20th century that has been continually used, used for 30, 40 years after his death. This is a great book, but he embraced the Westcott and Hort text. Why did these great men like A.T. Robertson and J. Gresham Machen embrace that? For one reason and only one reason. They have no other reason, and they don't even say there's another reason. They say they embrace this text. It was before it became quite controversial. They embraced it because the manuscripts or the copies go back to the early part of the 4th century, somewhere around 3 15 to 325 A.D. These copies, we can date back the copies that you can take the NIV from back to, you say, Jim, that's not far enough. I agree, that ain't far enough to date back. How far back can we date the Textus Receptus copies? Not how far back can we date the Textus Receptus, but how far can we date the copies? When I say copy, that copy machine back there. We can copy something exactly the way it's written. They didn't do that. They copied with copyists. They were scribes. They would sit down. If Paul wrote a letter to Corinth, and he did, he wrote a letter to Corinth. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Here's Corinth here in Greece, down here on the Peloponnesus of Greece. And Paul wants to share this letter. They didn't have Bibles. They didn't have a correlation of the Scriptures yet. And he wants, and these people at Corinth want to share this letter with the people at Ephesus or with the people at Colossia over here. Or they want to share it with the Jews down here at Jerusalem. Or they want to share it with Bithynia or with Cappadocia or with Troas. Or any of these other churches are with Pergamos up here, the seven churches in Asia. They want to share it. How are they going to share it? Or they want to share it with Philippi or Thessalonica. What they do is they get a bunch of copyists and may, they may get 25 men to sit down and write this by hand. Well, some guy's tired one night, like I was the other night. I was, I study and sometimes I get up the next morning and look at my notes and it's, C-R-I-N-T-A-V. <laughs> and that's kind of, and sometimes I'm that tired, I'll be going, and I have to scratch it out and start over. So when they wanted to do this, that's what they'd do. They'd have copyists do this. Well, some of the copyists, if they weren't really committed to Christ and truth and the Word of God, then they might say, I don't like this verse. I'll change this. Well, that's exactly what they did. Now, here's the problem. How far back does the Textus Receptus date? Not the Textus Receptus, but the copies. The copies that we've got, the oldest copies that we've got, where we get this interlinear Bible, how old are the oldest copies of these, these Greek texts? They only go back to, they only go back to the the end of the 4th century, around 375, somewhere there to 395, somewhere in that neighborhood. Whoops! What do you see? What they did, the great scholars said, we accept this 315 to 325 A.D. text or copies. Copies doesn't mean the original. So they say we date back to here, well, what amazes me, here's what amazes me. 
Vaticanus Alexandrian, Roman Catholic text, not Roman Catholic Bible. It looks apparently, they, this, I like what Dean Burgeon says. He was a great uh, researcher of textual criticism in the 1800s. But he said, the Vaticanus stayed in a, stayed in a uh, library in the Vatican for 1600 years. And they come up and dug the Baeth, Alexandrian text, out of a wastebasket in Alexandria, Egypt. And then they put it together, and then we come up with the NIV, the AS, uh, ASV, the RSV, and all the rest of these, and they come from this text. You say, what's the difference, Jim? What does it matter as long as it's the Word of God? Well, let me show you one of the differences. Just one of the differences. I've got a... I, I keep... I keep a, uh, if I can find it, I keep an NIV for the sake of research. I'm not going to teach out of this. This is wrong is what it is. It's an NIV. Now, let me read to you John 3.16 out of the NIV, okay? John 3 and 16. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That is a lie. He did not give his one and only son. He gave his only begotten. The first begotten of God. The only one. The monogenos. The only begotten. Now you say, how could that be wrong? Well, in the, in, the, t in the Texas Receptus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, back over here, take, if, I hope you've got a uh, King James Bible. Now I prove, I show how King James has got a lot of error in it. But go back over here to Exodus. Go back to Exodus. Let's go to Exodus, the fourth chapter, the fourth chapter and the, now, the NIV says, one and only son. Verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, when thou goest to return into Egypt, when thou goest to return to Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart that he will not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, verse 22, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now wait a minute. Let's see what it says here in Exodus 4 and 22 in the NIV, okay? Now, that's contradicting, isn't it? He said Israel was his firstborn son, and then over in the NIV, it says he gave his one and only son. That's not true. Now, 4 and 22. All right. I'm reading out of the NIV this time. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Let me read out of the NIV, Exodus 4 and 22. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you, the power to do, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then, said, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. Wait a minute. They say Israel is the firstborn son in the NIV in 422 of Exodus. <coughs> And they say he gave his one and only son in John 3, 16. Is that contradictory? Yeah, contradictory. It's wrong. Look at, first, look at 1 John 3 and 1. Look in your King James Bible. 1 John. And sometimes the King James will be messed up in translation, but it does come from the correct text. And I'll show you why in a minute. All right. 1 John. 1 John 3 and 1. Here's what it says in the King James Bible. 1 John 3 and 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. 
How could he have given his one and only son? He didn't. He gave his only begotten. Didn't he? And aren't we called sons of God all through the scripture? First time I sat in a church, I heard a preacher read that. I went, whoa. And I said, I walked down. I said, what kind of Bible are you reading from? Well, it's an NIV, and that was back before they were real popular. The NIV was written in 1966. That's when it first came out. The RSV came out about 1948. The American Standard came out in the early 1900s. Now, he says here in, in the... Let me read to you here out of... Out of... The NIV, 1 John 3 and 1. 1 John 3 and 1. And now, dear children, continue. No, wait a minute, that's verse 20. Excuse me. All right. 1 John 3 and verse 1. How great is the love of the Father that has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. I guess children are sons, aren't we? Now, they translated sons, children, but they... The, haven't they contradicted themselves? Yes, they have. They not only contradict themselves in the English. Now, I keep this for reference sake only. You will not see me reading out of a King James, out of a NIV. And I'll prove the words wrong from a King James when they're wrong. We said here, from time to time, you'll find in the King James where that the translators, King James translators weren't a bunch of Christians. They were half Catholics and half Protestants that King James, a nut, uh, employed to get his own translation. He didn't know whether he was a Catholic or Protestant, but his mother was Mary Queen of Scots, and she was uh, heir to the, to the throne of England and heir to the throne of Scotland and heir to the throne of France, and she was playing games and brought up by Jesuits who taught her how to, be, how to deceive. And then she gives this to King James, and he comes up with his own translation. He did not translate with good translators. They had 53 when they started. They ended up, seven of them quit. And some of the better translators refused to allow this to be, uh, refused to allow one of the better translators to be on the board to translate. Now, you say, what difference does it make? Well, let me show you why it makes a difference. First of all, Jesus was the only begotten. Begotten means to take out of oneself. He was from eternity the Son of God, but he wasn't the only, he wasn't the only Son. He was the only begotten, the only one taken out of God himself, not to take from his deity upon the earth. Israel was the firstborn. Jesus was the secondborn upon the earth, and the secondborn receives the blessing always, doesn't it? The second birth, not the first birth. Cain was firstborn, Abel was secondborn. Cain slew Abel. Abel received the promise of God. Jacob was secondborn. Esau was firstborn. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Isaac was secondborn, wasn't he? Ishmael was firstborn. So Christ in the flesh was the secondborn of God. But in eternity, he was the only begotten. But he, wasn't, he didn't give his one and only son. He gave his only begotten son. And that word begotten is left out of the original text in the NIV or out of the Westcott and Hort text. Does that matter? It matters completely. Uh, now, here's the whole point. The whole point is this. How do you trace back and how do you make how do you get the Texas Receptus back further than the Westcott and Hort? There's probably the greatest authority is called the Church Fathers. The Church Fathers. How are we going to get them to verify this? Namely because mainly because there are certain texts that are left out of this text right here, this NIV, that are not in here, that are in the King James or from the Textus Receptus. And particularly the three that I've been dwelling on, 
The three that I've been spending time in, let me put them down here on this. Let me just stick them here in the middle of the board. Particularly, Mark 16, 9 through 20. You remember the other ones? Anybody? John, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Those are not in this text. 1 John 5 and verse 7. Now there's many more, but these are three of the most important verses that are not found in this. You say, I've got an NIV and I notice that it's there. <laughs> well, one more time for those of y'all that hadn't seen it. Oh, Mark 16. Mark 16. Let me give this to you. Mark 16. In the NIV, they evidently did this to pacify. They did it to pacify the American church, probably, of the world. Because right before they go into <coughs> verse 9, 9 through 20 is not in their text. Right as they go into verse 9, they've got a note here, and I've got it, I've got it colored in. The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. And I am here to stand up against the men who published this and say that is an out and out lie. Now when you read that, isn't it amazing? We think, well, I read it in the book, in the Bible, in the earliest. They're saying the earliest copies, a manuscript is a copy. They're saying the copies around 315 to 325 A.D., it's not in there. But that's the earliest copies that we know of. How are we going to get the text to Susceptus back prior to that? By the early church fathers. If I can come up with early church fathers quoting any of these verses before the, before the turn of the 4th century, 300 to 400 A.D. is the 4th century, isn't it? You got 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4 is the 4th century, right? If I can come up and predate these manuscripts with early church fathers who are not just church fathers, but who are founders of the early church, quoting from these verses right here, and why E.T. Robertson didn't figure that out, I don't know, and why J. Gresham Machen didn't figure that out, I don't know. But can we do that? Yes, we can. Now, where do you get the early church fathers? I've got the books right here. I don't have all of them. I've got a 38-volume set of church fathers. You've got what's called the, the, the anti-Nicene fathers. Let me write this down. Here's what's amazing to me. The Westcott and Hort copies go back to the beginning, around the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church at the Nicene Council met in 325 A.D. And that's where Roman Catholicism or the Mass began or the Christ Mass. And Christmas or Christ Mass didn't hit any calendar till 354 A.D. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas in early America. It didn't become an American holiday until 1856. And the Westcott and Hort dates right back at the beginning of Roman Catholicism. And it's called Vaticanus. And it's called St. Catherine's or Alexandrian text. Well, what we need to do is see if we can find some, some early church fathers who are reliable fathers. Who would that be? Well, let me write some of their names down, okay? You guys, see you later. Now, let me write some of their names down. Here's some of the names of some of the early church fathers. How about uh, Polycarp? And uh, Irenaeus. How about Ignatius? Cyprian. 
Tertullian. Hippolytus. And so on. And it goes on and on. Where do you get these from? Well, you've got a set of books. I've got all 38 volumes. You've got what's called the anti... Let me erase some of this so I can write this down up here. You've got something called... And in... You've got 10 volumes. You've got 10 volumes that are the Anti-Nicene Fathers. A-N-T-E. N-I-C-E-N-E. Anti-Nicene Fathers. Then you have the Nicene Fathers... Nicene Fathers, the Nicene Fathers, and then you have post-Nicene Fathers. Well, what do you think they mean by Nicene? They're talking about in 325 A.D. when the church was corrupted and Constantine started the Roman Catholic Church. We're talking about before the anti-Nicene means before Roman Catholicism started and before they got corrupt. Now, you had some false teachings going on before that, but not near as much as when this great harlot of Babylon got going full speed. It started corrupting everything, and that was about the time of the, of the creation of the Westcott and Horta, what's called the old Vaticanus in the Alexandrian text. Well, anti-Nicene, what we want to do is predate 325 A.D. and we want to verify some of these men as to how reliable are they. Well, I think Polycarp is about as reliable a man as ever walked on the face of the earth. He pastored, you remember, one of the churches of Asia, Smyrna? You remember that? He pastored that church while John was on the Isle of Patmos writing to him, writing the book of Revelation to him. He was pastor or bishop of the church of Smyrna. By the way, the word Smyrna, we get the word myrrh from Smyr, Smyrna, and myrrh is what they embalmed dead bodies with. I thought I'd just throw that in. Polycarp was a disciple and follower, and he traveled with John the Beloved. Now, I think that would be about his... He was a companion of John who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. That's about as reliable as you can get, isn't he? Huh? Yeah. And probably one of the greatest church fathers that ever existed and did more to perpetrate the truth and would fight for it, was Polycarp's convert. His name was Irenaeus. This man would kill, he would die for the gospel. Polycarp the same. Now, if you think, now just stop and think. Do you think as close as Polycarp was to John the Beloved, that if he wanted the real truth of the word of God, he would know who to go to? I guess, I guess if you knew John, that'd be the guy to go to, wouldn't it? And you had these guys here. Tertullian lived, now I don't agree with everything Tertullian said, but he lived 200, 225 A.D. That is before, that is before the 325 manuscripts. Now if we can get these guys quoting these verses here before the copies of, three, of 325 A.D., and you get men that travel with the apostles, there is no greater authority than the church fathers. Here is the, here is the, the anti-Nicene means before the Nicene Council met in 325 A.D. and before Roman Catholicism started. Well, I, this is just a few of the books right here. This is not all of them, but this is, this is the anti-Nicene. This isn't all the anti-Nicene. I just brought some of them down here. Now, here's the way you do. If you're going to prove something with the, with the anti-Nicene fathers, and you want to go with the anti-Nicene over the Nicene, why would that be? This is further along in time. Nicene fathers is going to be 20, 325, 350, 375. That's what the Nicene fathers are going to be. And the post-Nicene is going to be 
four, five hundred A.D., six hundred A.D., and on up. Well, we want to predate some of the most reliable men quoting these verses prior to 325 A.D. Well, what you do, this is a, you don't need all of these. You don't need all 38 volumes. It's a, it's a thorough history of the church. But what you need is at least the 10 volumes, if you're going to get them, to study textual criticism. This is part of them, and if you notice here, I'll just read some of the names to you. Well, that's an index. Here's Apostolic Fathers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus. This actually translates their writings from uh, ancient world, Hermas, Tatian, Anathagoras, Theophilus, Clement. Paul even speaks of Clement of Alexandria. He even mentions Clement. Uh, here is Tertullian. Here is more on Tertullian. He says it has a lot to say. The Twelve Patriarchs, Clementia, Apocryphal Gospels, Syriac Documents. And I'll go into that. Now, what you do is you take take your index. What did I do with my index? Put it on the bottom a bit, didn't I? Here it is. You take your index. In your index, they will give you every time a verse is mentioned in the Apostolic Fathers. You take your index. Hold on. I'm looking at the index of subject here. Here's the index of Bible verses. How they were quoted or how they were paraphrased by the early fathers. Well, don't you think the thing to do, and they're listed according to book. Here's Jeremiah. Here's Ezekiel. Here's 1 John. Oops, hey. 1 John. Can I find 1 John 5 and, ah, 5 and 7? All I need to do is go find out who that is. It'll tell me what volume it's in, what page it's on. Now, let me see here. 1 John 5 and 7. Oh, that's one of those verses they say. And when you read 1 John 5 and 6 in your NIV, and when you go to verse 7, they skip to verse 8. Verse 7 is not in the NIV. And that actually verifies the Trinity. But and when they say it's not in the earliest manuscripts, they mean it's not in the Westcott and Hort manuscripts. But we're going to predate them by finding out what the early church fathers had to say. So if you're going to go to Mark, see, Mark, let me see, Mark what? 16, 9 through 20. I wonder if they've got 16, 9 through 20 here. Well, let me see here. Mark, there's Romans. We'll back up to Mark. Matthew, Mark, here's what you do. Look here. I, this is my verifier here. He's always up front. Mark, don't you think what we need to do is find out if the, any of these guys predate the beginning of the fourth century. Here's Mark. Look here. Mark. Mark. 16. Woo. Goodness, greatness. Great day in the morning. Look here. Mark. 16, 1, 2, 16, 9. There's Mark 16 and 9. 16. Volume 3, page 206. Here's Mark 16, 14. That's not supposed to be in the Westcott and Hort text. Mark 16, 15, 16, Mark 16, 15 through 18, Mark 16, 16, Mark 16, 17, 18, Mark 16, 19, Mark 16, 25, Mark 16, well, I don't even know why they got this here. That must be a misprint. There ain't 33 verses in it. Now, can we find these? Now, I've already got these printed out up here. I don't have to go digging them out. I've got them set up. Let me see here. Gosh, I don't know where to go. Hold on here. Let me give you... Let me give you... All right. Tertullian. He speaks here. Well, hold on. Hold on. Let me get, let me get my stuff together. All right. Tertullian. Ah, let's go over here to Mark 16. Go to Mark 16. 
Go to Mark 16 in your Bibles. Mark 16. 16. Now, Mark 16, 9 through 20, that's the only time those verses are mentioned in the Bible. Now, this is out of, now what I did, I went through this. I went through here. I pulled these out and I started looking them up. Out of the treatise of the soul, it, it'll tell you what treatise it's from, but it'll tell you, if you look in the front of this, the treatise of the soul was written by Tertullian. In the front of the treatise of the soul, it'll tell you who wrote it. So Tertullian wrote it. Let's read verse 9. Verse 9 is not in the West Cotton Hort text, and if the guys had the guts, they wouldn't put it in the NIV. Because right be they don't have the guts to face the American public. They just simply say it's out of an inferior text. Hey, if you guys got the guts, won't you leave it out? Inferior text? You mean there's an inferior word of God? It says in the computer. It says in It says the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 19. You must have an NIV there. Yeah. I just pulled it up. Yeah. They put it in anyway, which is probably... Oh, they put all of them in there. Yeah. You put all of them. Okay. But it's probably not correct. Okay, well, we know it's not correct. <laughs> now look here, look at verse 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. That's the only time that's mentioned. Let me read what Tertullian said. For instance, of demoniacal possession, and that not of one only, as in the case of Socrates' own demon, but of seven spirits, as in the case of Mary Magdalene. He refers to that. Tertullian refers to it, doesn't he? He's referring to that. That's the only place that's mentioned in the Bible. Where do you find out about Tertullian? When did he live? Take your McClinic and Strong. It's got all of the church fathers in it. It'll tell you their birth dates, their death dates. Now, here's the article on Tertullian out of McClinic and Strong. Tertullian is the most ancient of the Latin fathers whose works are now extant or known, and one of the most noteworthy personages belonging to the early church. Our knowledge of his personal history is extremely limited. He was born at Carthage in A.D. 160. Well, his birth is a long time before the early 4th century, isn't it? Well in excess of 140 years before the 4th century begins, isn't it? And the manuscripts of the, West, of the Westcott and Hort, or Alexandria, Aleph and Beth, go back to after the beginning of the 4th century. Well, his birth was in 160. Well, let's see if we can find his death in here. You see what I'm saying? What we're doing is tracing down when did he live. All right. He died in old age between A.D. 220 and 240. That is a long time before the earliest manuscripts, isn't it? A long time before the earliest manuscripts of the Westcott and Hort, and he's quoting from Mark 16 and 9. You see what I'm saying? Now, I don't know why. A.T. Robertson is a wonderful Greek scholar, but he followed the Westcott and Hort text, and probably because before it was challenged much. Otherwise, A.T. Robertson was too smart a man to have continued to follow it. If he'd lived later on, like today, and... Uh, and, and was actually fighting the problems that we're fighting today. Okay. Well, that's one of them. Put that over there, okay? <laughs> Isn't that good, though? Don't y'all like that? Ah. Tischendorf, who is a... Tischendorf, who is a proponent of Westcott and Hort, he was a peer of Mr. Hort. He 
he knew him. Mr. Tischendorf quotes from Mark 16 and 16 from the Gospel of Nicodemus. Where do you find the Gospel of Nicodemus? You look in your McClinic and Strong. They'll tell you what it is and when it was. But you don't even have to go there because Mr. Tischendorf himself, he assigns the Gospel of Nicodemus without hesitation to the third century. When is the third century? 300 A.D. to 400 A.D., isn't it? Before the fourth century, Westcott and Hort, I'll call it Westcott and Hort, NIV text, Vaticanus, Alexandrian text, Verse chapter 14 in the Gospel of Nicodemus. And a few days after there came from Galilee to Jerusalem three men. One of them was a priest by name Phinehas, the second a Levi by name Agai, and the third a soldier by name Addis. These came to the chief priest and said to them and to the people, Jesus whom you crucified we have in Galilee with his eleven disciples upon the Mount of Olives teaching them and saying, Go into all the world, proclaim the good news, and whosoever will believe will be baptized, and, and be baptized shall be saved, but whosoever shall not, be, not believe shall be condemned or shall be damned. That is alluding to Mark, the 16th chapter and the 16th verse. Let's read it. It's the only place, it's the only place that's quoted in the New Testament English Bible. And that is... That was assigned even by the enemy to the third century. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even the enemy will give you some verses and assign them to the third century before the copies of the Westcott, first copies of the West Cotton Hort came up. Read that verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. That's what. That's what this Gospel of Nicodemus, which was written between 300 A.D. and 400 A.D., before the first manuscripts of Westcott and Hort. What about this next verse here? Is that included in it? No, they don't quote every one of them. They quote for some of them. The point is this. It's not whether you can get all of these verses quoted. It's whether you get one of them quoted. Whether you can even get them paraphrased. Do you understand what I'm saying? If there's any allusion to them whatsoever, they're saying these didn't exist till sometimes later after 325 A.D. You understand what I'm saying? They're saying none of these existed till some later date, and we're not only predating these, we're going back to some of the early church fathers, and they're either getting them verbatim, or they're quoting from them, or they're paraphrasing these very words. Unbelievable, isn't it? Now, I don't have two or three of these. I got a whole slew of this stuff. Huh. John 6, John 7, 53. John 7, 53 to 8, 11 is not in the West Cotton Heart. If you look in there, you'll see it. It's not in there. They'll say that is from an inferior text. Let me read out of the Constitutions of the Apostles. How do you go find out where the constitutions of the apostles are? Would you take a wild guess? Look in your McClintock and Strong. Look up constitution. <laughs> That's funny because I've got it printed out here. Look here. I got it right here. This comes out of McClintock and Strong. Constitutions, apost apostical, uh, apostolical, see canons. Clementines. It'll tell you what to go see and where it comes from. Constitutions of the Apostles. Let me give you this. Let's go over here to John 7. Let's go to John 7. Oh, excuse me, John 8. Go to John 8. All right. It's okay. Y'all going. I know you got stuff to do. It's all right. We're going to stay here and do this if one's left. All right. John 8, 11. John 8, 11 is not in the Westcott and Hort text. John 8, 11. 
this is where the this is where the McClinic and Strong comes in handy. This is where they'll tell you who these people are. Ha! Ah, where do I start here? Well, I'll just read where I've got underlined. This now this is very important. Book two. This is book two. You see it? Notice up there, Constitutions of the Apostles. When you look in here, it'll have. Uh, You'll, you never heard a lot of these things, but these were early writings. There's origins, the principles, instructions of commodians. Uh, and one of these will say constitutions of the apostles. Tertullian against Marcion. You see what I'm saying? The chaplet or de corona. Now, here's what he says in the constitutions of the apostles. He said unto her, Go thy way, therefore, for neither do I condemn thee. John, John, 1, John 8, 1 through 11 is about the woman taking an adultery. They say that's not in the text of the Westcott and Hort. Well, let's look at it here in John 8. John 8, 11. Jesus is talking to the woman. He says, Woman, where are thine accusers? In verse 10, Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And they say that is not in. They say that's not in the proper text. But it's in the Constitutions of the Apostles, book 2. Well, what we're looking for, you know what you're looking for? When these men lived and when they quoted these things. Now, in the introductory notice, when you look this up, in the Apostolic Fathers, the Antinicene Fathers, when you look this up, it'll have an introduction. Here's an introductory notice at the front of the Constitutions of the Apostles. Notice, Book 2, Neither do I condemn thee. Now watch. Introductory notice to the Constitution of the Apostles. He's telling you something about the Constitution of the Apostles. Listen to this paragraph right here. Dr. Von Dre regards the first six books as of Eastern origin. We're talking about book two, aren't we? That's part of the first six books, isn't it? Now, Dr. Von Dre regards the first six books of Eastern origin mainly Syrian, and to be assigned to the second half of the third century. This neither do I condemn thee in the, in the constitutions of the apostles was written somewhere between 250 A.D. and 300 A.D. before the discovery of these, 320, these manuscripts of the Westcott and Hort, where you get the NIV from. Has anybody ever wondered why their NIV, why your King James don't read like the preacher's Bible when he's reading from an NIV? That's why. Have you ever had that happen? And they're wandering off somewhere in space. Then he says, go to, I go, hold on a second here. He said, look at the canons of Scripture and look at the Clementines The Clementines, some of these were ascribed to Clement, a man who lived 92 to 102 A.D. Hold on here. Apostolic constitutions and canons, including the Liturgy of St. Clement, which is a part of the 8th book of the Constitutions. This is a collection of ecclesiastical laws and usages which grew up gradually during the first four centuries and is valuable chiefly as a rich source of information concerning ancient church government, worship, and practice. The work professes to be a bequest of all the apostles handed down through the Roman bishop Clement or dictated to him. It contains in eight books, and we read from book two, didn't we? And that was written between 250 and 300 A.D. Notice, if you don't get the dates right in the men and when they lived and when they quoted these things, then you can't verify it. The first six books were written at the end of the third century. They say that in McClinic and Strong. You understand the importance of this? 
McClinic and Strong does is not only do the Apostolic Fathers say this, but McClinic and Strong verifies that. The Cyclopedia of Biblical Ecclesiastical Theological Literature verifies written at the end of the third century, the first six books. I thought I'd just read that to you. Hmm. They were collected by some unknown hand about the middle of the fourth century. And you know what? It don't matter who quoted them. It don't matter if some pagans quoted them. Before 325, it means they were around, doesn't it? That's the point. But not only were they around, they're being quoted by these. How about some more? The early church fathers is what's going to verify the Textus Receptus. That's when, when I'm teaching, I pick up the interlinear Bible and I go to it. Now, you're going to have people come up to you and tell you. They're going to say, I'll, let me give you an illustration. They're going to say why in the original text, the Bible doesn't say the love of money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is a root of all evil. No, in the Westcott and Hort text, it says the love of money is a root. It uses an indefinite article in the Textus Receptus. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Wherever there is a love of money, wherever there is evil, there is a love of self. See, if you can say the love of money is a root of all evil, then you can say, well, there's other roots to evil. Not in the Textus Receptus. And if somebody tells you that, well, the earliest reliable manuscripts say the love of money is a root of all evil. Say, no, they, no, they don't. The earliest manuscripts may say it, but the earliest text doesn't say it. And we're proving that this is the earliest text by quoting from these great fathers here. Is that important? Boy, I guess, isn't it? So anybody who says that, and of course, is that important to know that the love of money... Because when we get into the study of demons, there is no such thing as demons. It's deamon, deamonion. <laughs> Where's my pens? So whenever you get D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N, deamonion, that word means to distribute fortunes. Well, I think that's the love of money, isn't it? Huh? That's the word demon or demonion. And didn't Satan tell Jesus, fall down and worship me, I'll give you the fortunes of the world. And what's so scary is the word capitalism defines just like the word demonion. Means to distribute the wealth or the fortunes of the world to the individual. See, if you say the love of money is a root of all evil out of the Westcott and Hort text, that's why it's important. Let me read. Look here. Let me show you something. Here's a morpheme's book. Morpheme comes from morphe meaning shape. We say metamorphosis. We say sumorphos, predestined to be conformed, sumorphos, shaped in fellowship with. This is a morpheme's book. And I think I've got it here. Let me see here. I usually have it. More. Here it is. We said a while ago that a triangle, a capital, D is a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. David starts capital D, it's a triangle, right? That's a, tri that's a D right there, right? Del. Yep. Dio. D A I O. To distribute. Hmm. People get mad at me, and this is a. That, I wrote this, I wrote the Greek language. <laughs> 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 now look here. Look at that. You see that I'm going to scoot over here. I'm going to leave the camera. Y'all can shine it over here on me if you want to. Look here. That's a D. A D is like a... That's a D. Here's an A. Their A is like an I in Omega. Dio to distribute. That's all the words it comes from. Now when you think that the love of money is a root of all evil and you go along with the, you go along with the Westcott and Hort then you can make an excuse. Well, it's not, it's not evil if you kind of just, uh, and you start making an excuse for yourself. It's easy to make an excuse if you can say it's one of the roots of all evil, but when I use it, it's not.
and dio meaning to distribute fortunes, and I was going to show you something else on it. I've heard people say it's the root of some evil. Yeah, well, the Bible says, the Textus Receptus says it is the root of all evil. And of course, let me just go ahead and say this. How are you going to translate love of money correctly? Because love of money is just one word in the Greek. Well, well, I'm losing everything. Look here. Here's the word. Let me erase this, and I'll go back to one of these. Yeah, what, uh, what tense is the word the in that text? Because you said that there's uh, 25 different Well, things. these don't have tenses. Well, what, what you were saying about the... The, the love of money? Yeah, and... I'd have to look it up. The root of all evil? I don't know. I'd have to look it up. It's over there in First Timothy. We can look at it. The love of money. All right, let me see here. First Timothy, this is the way you do. You look, the, if you're going to look it up, First Timothy 6, okay. Let me see, great godliness. Now, having food and clothing, let us be content. Foods, clothing, these things satisfied. It's going to be hurtful. Destruction for all is in the, is. Okay, for of all evils is, is the, hey, 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 feminine gender, it's feminine gender, and because, because, because what's feminine is Babylon, Babylon's the mother of harlots, she was built upon, let us make us a name herself, that's what it would be. So the love of money is the root of all evil. The is hay. That's good. Thank you for asking. Just huh? Just wondered. Huh? Many things. Yeah. <laughs> now let me show you one other thing, and then I'll stop. What? To, have, where am I? Yeah, okay. Let me show y'all this. The epistles of Pope Callistus. That's one of the sections in this right here. The epistle epistles. Let me show you. Pope, say L-L-I-S-T-U-S, -L Pope Callistus. Well, I'm, and look here, he says, in the epistles of Pope Callistus, Pope, you mean a Roman Catholic? No. Pope means father or papa, is what it means. And before 325 A.D., before 325 when they made the father of the Roman Catholic Church, and they gave him the name Pope, or father, means pop. We get the word pop from that. All of the bishops of the churches were called Pope. But it didn't mean they were Roman Catholics, because Roman Catholicism doesn't start till 325 A.D. Well, let me read this. The epistles of Pope Calix Callistus. Let him see to it that he sin no more, that the sentence of the gospel may abide in him. Go and sin no more. That is quoted in John 8, 11. And they say that's not there. Well, what do we do about Pope Callistus? Well, what we do, what I did, I went to McClinic and Strong. Who'd have thought? Huh? Who'd have thought? Hey, look at there. Callistus. See Callistus the first. So what I did in my McClinics and Strong, my Encyclopedia of Biblical, Ecclesiastical, Theological Literature, I went to Calixtus the first. That's how, that's how these books work together with McClinics and Strong. What we're doing is looking for dates in men who lived before 320, before the beginning of the 4th century, quoting these verses that they say are not in the text. Say, Jim, you shouldn't get excited. I get excited in the middle of the night. I get bent because of what they've done. It doesn't matter that they polluted the Word of God and you're reading along and none of this stuff makes sense. And the reason you need a King James Bible is because we got all of these word study helps that you can go back and you look up the Greek words and you get all, and all of that was most of it was keyed to a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, which was from the King James text. Calixtus the first. Let me read this. We just read from John 8, 11, go and sin no more. That's the only time. You say, well, doesn't it say it somewhere else? No, it doesn't. The only time that was said was to the woman taken in adultery. Well, if it's only said one time, well, how many times does God have to say something for it to be true? 
what, what about the, the blind man that he had go and wash himself in that certain pool? That's not go and sin no more. What, what are These are the very words, go and sin no more. We're talking about this is taken from... We're not concerned about other verses. We're just concerned with these that they say are not in this text. In the, they say it's not in the... They say the reason that this is an older text is because the reason it's the right text is it's older than... It's older copies than this. And what we're doing, we're finding people quoting verses that are in this that are not in this that exist before this came along. You see what I'm... Do y'all see that? Am I confusing anybody? Well, good. Okay. Now, now this is in the epistles of Pope Calixtus, Go and Sin No More, John 8, 11. Calixtus I, Pope, the son of Dionysius, a Roman, succeeded Zephyrinius in 217 or 220. He was put to death by being drowned in a well after suffering a long imprisonment up October 14th, 222 A.D. What does that mean? That he wrote, go and sin no more before 222 A.D. And that was a hundred years before the, before the Westcott and Hort text was even discovered. And they said that these words aren't the word of God because they're not in the text of Susceptus because they found copies after this. This was before the, all of that. And all of your men, your proponents of the text of Susceptus will tell you that our hope is in these church fathers. These guys fought. Now, you say, Jim, how am I going to know these things? Let me read the rest of this. Well, I won't go into this. Let me show you one other thing. It's too much stuff. Let me show you one other thing. Pope Calixtus the first. Wait a minute. Let me show you something about popes. Okay? Hold on. I got it over here. Here's Irenaeus. I got more. All right. Pope. Pope. Where did I get this? McClinic and Strong is where I got this. <laughs> and McClinic and Strong is an invaluable set of books. Huh? Strong. The word Pope. The title, the word Pope is derived from the Latin Papa, Greek Papas meaning father. See, when Calixtus was around, the Roman Catholic Church hadn't been invented yet. And he was called Pope Calixtus. Why? He was the father or the bishop of the church. While the Greek word used in the Greek church to designate both bishops and priests and has gradually come to be reserved for the priest exclusively, the Latin term was for several centuries a title applied to all bishops, all bishops, and the common word for bishop is episcopeo, E-P-I, S-K-O-P-E-O. -E you remember there in the New Testament, I've brought that out many times, epi means over, Scopeo, we say scope. It means to see over, or be an overseer. That's a bishop. It means an overseer bishop, and that's what they called a pope. Now look here, I'm going to show you this. Look here. Here is a list out of McClinic and Strong. Look here. Here's a list of all the bishops or all the popes or heads of the church. And look here. Number 17 is Calixtus, Rome, 221, 227. And he said, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. He said the very words over a hundred years before the discovery of the manuscripts of the Westcott and Hort. Is this important? Yeah, it is. It's completely, it's all important. Let me show you one thing that you might, when you're, when you, I'm going to show you this because you're going to run across this when you run across the Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at John 1.1. 1, 1. See, all of this, 
And along the way, you can have copies of these. But look at John 1, 1, and I'm going to read it to you and show you how they've messed up even the King James Bible. I keep bringing this out, and I've got more of these. But it, you know what? When we're studying this, this can get a little boring if you're not really paying attention, if, if you're not that interested. It's hard enough to teach somebody Christmas or predestination. When you get into this, you get into intricate details. You've got to have births of these men. You've got to have when, when they died, how reliable was their word. And how much did they want to retain the true inerrancy of Scripture? Not like these guys say. Look at John 1.1, 1, 1, and I'm going to show you what you're going to run across. When you run across a Jehovah's Witness, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, it says, in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says the Word was a God. Mm. Now, the reason they're going to say that, they're going to say, when it says the Word was God, if there is no, you got three articles. Let me show you this because you're going to run across this. The Word was a God is what it says in theirs. You got three articles. You have the, a, and an. A and an are indefinite articles. When you have an indefinite article, it means there can be another something. If you have a definite article in a given situation, it means it eliminates every other. Well, when you, don't, when you have a noun in the Greek, in a sentence, and if it does not have a definite article, it usually implies an indefinite article, so they put the indefinite article in there. But there's only one problem. It doesn't read like that in the original text. Let me show you why. Let me read it to you the original text. Okay? In our K, hein hologos, chi hologos, a pros. I know that makes sense. Tan theu, chi. Theos he hologos. That's very important what I just said. Because it doesn't say that in the beginning of the word was with God. The word was God. It says God was the word. God is not the nom predicate nominative. God is the subject, so you don't have to have the in front of it. Not in this text. It says God was the Word. It doesn't mean a God was the Word. So you don't even have to go to the context of Scripture where there is one God. You see what I'm saying? It was a subject in the original text. They turned it into a predicate nominative. You know what a predicate nominative is, don't you? You remember that? If I said, he was the boy. A predicate nominative is something in the predicate has the same meaning as the subject. Or John was the manager. Manager is the predicate nominative. The manager is the same thing in the predicate as John. That's predicate nominative. Or when it says the the word was God. God is a predicate nominative, and without a definite, without a definite article, you can't insert an indefinite article. But that's not the way it reads. You don't put an indefinite article unless it's called for in front of the subject of the sentence in the Greek. It says God was the. Word. So go tell some Jehovah's Witness that and let them get all bent out of shape because that's what it says in the original text. Can you turn predicate nominatives, can you take a subject and turn it into predicate nominative? No. Why did they do it? I don't know why they did it. Translators. You see what I'm saying? I'm about out of time here. Let me give you one other thing. Ah, uh, I've got so, many, so much of this. When we're, get, when we're in textual criticism, does everybody understand what we've been talking about? Sometimes I feel like I'm, 
I hope I'm not getting too over. You know, I know when you've never heard of the church fathers before, probably y'all hadn't heard of them, have you? They're the founders of the church 2,000 years ago. Isn't that amazing? And they said some things. I've got one book, just a one volume book called The Apostolic Fathers. They said things that the Puritans didn't even think of saying. They spoke of, of baptism being a blood baptism. They spoke of, of uh, not eating crackers and drinking grape juice. They spoke of, one of them, I believe it was Ignatius, said, Oh, that I may be ground in the teeth of wild beasts, that I may be found to be pure bread. He knew he was the bread. We being many are one bread in one body. He knew that the bread was Christ in us, and when Jesus took bread and break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, and the body's the church, he was saying, Partake in the church. And Ignatius said, I want to be ground in the teeth of wild beasts, and evil men were called wild beasts. If you read these guys in the first centuries, especially you get somebody like Irenaeus, he'll take it and grind it home, the truth. These guys fought for the truth. I'll give you one other thing here. In, oh man, let me see here if I can find this. I think I can. Yeah, here it is. In Irenaeus, Irenaeus, remember him? Huh? Irenaeus, Polycarp. I tell you what's amazing. When we talk about drinking the cup, we're not talking about drinking grape juice. To drink of a cup meant to undergo a death. Polycarp was the companion of John, the writer of the Gospels and Revelation in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Polycarp was martyred. And when they took him to the stake, he kissed the stake and said, Now I will drink the cup of my Lord. He didn't say pass the grape juice. Polycarp said, now I get to drink the cup. He didn't mean I've been drink, eating crackers and drinking grape juice along the way. And he is probably one of the greatest of all of the, of the converts of the early church was his convert, Irenaeus. And you know what these guys have to do that, that wrote the, that come up with the Westcott and Hort? You say, where did that Westcott and Hort come from? Evidently, somewhere along the way, some copyists polluted the Textus Receptus and left out certain things and switched it because they didn't like what it was saying. Uh, Irenaeus, now, what the, what the proponents of the Westcott and Hort, the Westcott and Hort, what they do with these early church fathers, they, what do you do when some guy is telling the truth you have to make false accusations about him, don't you? Well, that's what they did. They said that Irenaeus and Polycarp, they didn't really believe, and Ignatius and Cyprian and Hippolytus, that they didn't really believe that, that the Scripture was the Word of God. You mean they died for it and they didn't believe it was the Word of God? Besides that, they said they did. They fought, I mean, fought tooth and nail for it. Irenaeus attached to the close of his treatise on the Ogdode, the following note, I adjure you, they would say they didn't care how things were copied. He said, I adjure you who copy out of this book by our Lord Jesus Christ and by his glorious advent when he comes to judge the living and the dead that you compare what you transcribed and correct it carefully against this manuscript from which you copy. Do it right. That's what Irenaeus said. He said, don't you mess with it. And this was his own writings. If Irenaeus took such extreme precautions for the accurate transmission of his own work, how much more would he be concerned for the accurate copying of the Word of God? In fact, he demonstrates his concern for the accuracy of the text by defending the traditional reading of a single letter. He'll defend a single letter. The question is whether John the Apostle wrote, let me show you this. This really kind of nails something on the 
just nails something. This nails these guys against the wall. Irenaeus, a man who knew Polycarp and no doubt knew John the Beloved. He ran around with these guys. Who do you think? Do you think when the apostles died, that was all there was to it? No, they had converts that walked with them and went with them. And when they died the martyr's death, it was Irenaeus that took up the banner. Let me just read this and I'll quit. In fact, he demonstrates his concern for the accuracy of the text by defending the traditional reading of a single letter. The question is whether John the Apostle wrote Ki Kazi Sigma. Let me, let me show you this. Because this really... Now, Irenaeus... He was the convert of Polycarp. Polycarp was the convert of John, the beloved, who wrote the book of Revelation. And Irenaeus is arguing over something that was written in the book of Revelation. Do you think Irenaeus, being a wonderful man of God and a beloved man of truth who loved Polycarp and loved John the beloved, is going to misquote John? No, and he got... He got and John, who was writing these inspirational words of God, he was teaching Polycarp and Irenaeus. And Irenaeus is arguing whether the, John the Apostle wrote Ki, X, Kazi, Ki, that's a key, C-H, and Z, that's an X, that's a CHX, CHX. This is not an X down here. That's a CH. This is an X. <laughs> Looks like a strange looking E. Whether, whether John the Apostle wrote Key Kazi Sigma or Key. Iota Sigma in Revelation 13, 18. Look at Revelation 13, 18. He sang, he wrote Ki Kazi Sigma and he didn't write this. Evidently one of the early manuscripts had this in it. But he wasn't even arguing this against the Westcott or the uh, the well, let's just call it the Westcott and Hort. He was not arguing this against the Westcott and Hort, what became the Westcott and Hort. He was arguing, let me read this. Irenaeus asserts that 666 is found in all most approved and ancient copies and that those men who saw John face to face, and he warns those who made the change of a single letter that there should be no light punishment upon him who either adds or subtracts from the scripture. He was, he was fighting for Ki Kazi Sigma. Ki, that's the C-H. Kazi, that's the X. S. Huh? Well, there you are. And always an S is like that on the end of a word. It's like this in the middle of a word. This is in the middle of a word. This is always on the end. Okay? I, I should have had him put that up here, but like that. Because that's... All right, now, let me show you this. He was arguing for Ki Kazi Sigma over some text that had this in it. And when did Irenaeus live? Well, let me show you this. Irenaeus, huh? He had to live close back to John, didn't he? Because he was a convert of Polycarp. Irenaeus. Dodwell places it about A.D. 97. The dates of his birth, around 97, or about 108. That's long before the 4th century, isn't it? And students of the church fathers inclined to put it between the years 120 and 140. At the very maximum, he's a long way from the 4th century, isn't he? Well, let me show you this. Let me just show you this. This will help. Where's my, here it is. Let's read that last verse of Revelation 13 out of our King James Bible. Let's read it. 
And I want to really emphasize something here so you can see something. Revelation 13. Here is the wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now he's saying it is ki kazi sigma. That's what he's saying. Now look here. Let me show you this. Let's look at Revelation. I'm going to stop after this. I know it's late. Hold on. Look here. Revelation 13. I'm going to get Jerry to verify this. Look here. Look here. 666. See that? Key, mm -hmm. Kazi, Sigma. Right? Mm -hmm. He was arguing for this text unless you can get it out of this text. Here is this text. Right here. Let's see if it's got that in the end of it. And here's the point I'm getting at. Revelation, here it is right here. Apocalypse of John, Revelation 13, last verse. Look here. They have it spelled out. Eke Kasiai. Eke Kanta, that's 660, and Ekezi. They've got it written out. Now here's the point. It's not in the Westcott and Hort text. Is it? Could you see that? Kazi. Key Kazi Sigma is not in the Westcott and Hort text. It's not there. It doesn't matter what text this was. That's not the Westcott and Hort text either. But he was arguing for this somewhere in the second century over whatever text this was, and he was arguing for something that was in the Textus Receptus in the early part of the second century when the men who come up with the Westcott and Hort say say that the Textus Receptus is incorrect, and we got Irenaeus arguing for the Textus Receptus. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I, hope, I don't know if you can understand all of this, but we are messed up with our... And what is the most popular Bible in the world? N I. V, it outsells everything else. I mean, probably a hundred to one. Does it matter? Lord, help us. I hope y'all can, I feel like I'm getting a lot of, that I'm talking a lot of complex things. You understand what I'm saying, Corinne? Yeah. I hope you understand we need not a King James Bible. We need this text that we could go to, don't we? That's why I go to the, to the Textus Receptus. I want to know what's the words means? What's the tenses, moods, and the voices? What is the gender? Well, I hope this affects y'all some. At least maybe it'll help you realize why. And you know what this is? A confusion of languages, isn't it? Uh, we're back to a confusion of tongues is where we are. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. God, help us to continue in this, to ex expose the false texts. Give us strength to stand during this apostate time. And God will continue to praise you and glorify you.